So we um, we mixed up the the schedule. I'm going before just because we had the Skype test. Um, I was originally supposed to present with Otto Eiskender, which is um, he's a professor at Georgetown, and I served as the campus ambassador for his class um, the past two semesters at Georgetown. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today, so we're going to have him Skype in. Um, so the name of our talk is Translation and Transnational Scholarship, which were two phenomenons that emerged after the course um, that I didn't really take with him, but I served as the ambassador as part of the, the Wikipedia education program, which, which is essentially um, it's a program that provides assistance to professors at universities. Um, we've served 14 courses thus far at Georgetown. It's been really successful. Um, we've gotten a lot new, more articles that have come up on Wikipedia. Um, and so what we do is we have like support materials like um, how to do wiki text. And we go into the course um, on the first day. I think that <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the way that we support the classes is it's designed so we go into the class and we give a tutorial on the introduction to um, Wikipedia. Um, and that's in essentially um, the culture of Wikipedia. What is the culture of Wikipedia? How can we um, enhance the student learning um, to cooperate with the way that the infrastructure of Wikipedia um, or how it already exists. Um, and as a ca campus ambassador, I was trained on, you know, how to make a new article, what is wiki text, etc. And then we also have online ambassadors, which you can access through this IRC chat. So if a student needs help at home when they're going to um, make an edit, they can go onto the live chat and ask for help. So there's kind of this um, online infrastructure of help as well as support in the classroom. And it was really ideal to have it this way so that way I can meet with Otto to kind of discuss the plan of the assignment in the course. It provides a face-to-face -face kind of support that, was, um, that worked really well. Um, so um, yesterday there was a talk on um, can social awards create better wikis? I don't know if any of you guys were at that panel, but um, it got me thinking about you know, in the classroom, what sort of incentives are we giving the <coughs> students to contribute to Wikipedia? And I thought, okay, there's the leaderboard, which if you go to the Wikipedia education program, there's a leaderboard which measures how many bytes each article um, has and how it um, is advanced throughout the course and beyond the course. Um, so the life of the article, so saying that the life of the article is an incentive for the students, so rather than just turning in a term paper at the end of the quarter, that their piece of work lives on beyond the course. Um, also grades, I mean obviously it's a graded assignment, it's part of the course, so that's an incentive for the students. But also there's unintended outcomes, and this is a particular, um, particularly um, insightful piece that the student who in 2010 with Leona Davis who was a part of launching the education program at Georgetown the student made an article about the National Democratic Party of Egypt and it just so turns out that in January 2011 when kind of the revolution was happening his article got a ton of you know, press on this. So he actually ended up getting an award. So this unintended outcome um, of just kind, kind of engaging with the Wikipedia community was a way for us to also engage other professors to come in and show interest in the program. Um, if you can see, I don't think you guys can see in the back, but um, one of the quote that the student said was, I like the idea of academics and students giving back to the community. And Wikipedia is a great place to do this. Too often, students write for only two people, themselves and the teacher. So I thought that was a really insightful quote from the student um, to kind of show that it's, it's not so much just about me writing this article, it's about contributing to a kind of a global movement. And this is especially important for um, Arab media and a very emerging um, type of site of discourse right now. Um, so there was two graduate courses this past semester that I was a campus ambassador for. One was called New Media Innovation, Community and Dissidents, and the other was Media and Communications in the Arab World. And, it, and in each course, um, there, every student had to do a new article creation, and they also had in-class group edits. 
And the group edits worked where um, Otto came up with topics that he found would be legitimate and all the students would get together in groups and start the article in the class and then they would add live edits. There were some conflicts because for some reason the Georgetown um, IP address, I don't know what happened, but we got like, we were accused of vandalism or something. So <laughs> I don't know why that happened, but um, so it was hard for us to do that because there was lots of edit conflicts and our IP address was unblocked, um, but that was a, un a unique case. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so these were two of the articles that were created, and as you'll see, um, these were newly created articles, and actually in the spring, there were heaps more that were created. Um, this is just a list, and most of them were about um, some sort of a technology um, in Egypt or a specific person that was um, prominent in the movement. Um, the Speak to Tweet article was really interesting because what happened was, um, well, let me frame it this way first. How do you get students to create an article about a specific phenomenon that is not written about significantly in the world, right? There's not a lot of sources. So how do you make that notable to be written about? And it's a very, very interesting time to be doing this because the Rasid News um, network is a Facebook news feed. So how do you write about a news feed, you know? So there's this barrier of trying to get the students to understand how to write in a neutral tone, but also make it, um, also find the sources as well to do that. Um, but now the Rasid News Network is very notable. Um, but at the time when the article was being created, it was not. But now people can go to the Wikipedia article site. Speak to Tweet was about um, when volunteers would, um, when the when the internet was down, when there was internet blackout in Egypt, they would call um, the local phone number and people would tweet what the people on the phone were saying. So in a sense, there was like a level of translation um, of the actual phenomenon and then translating that onto Wikipedia itself was another phenomenon. So there was a total of um, 17 new English articles on the, the Arab, um, or not, that were about Arab media. Um, and as we'll talk about later in this um, PowerPoint, Otto will talk about this, is that having this new content online is an incentive for people that just recently launched the, um, what do you call it, the Cairo pilot program for education in Cairo to then translate these articles into the Wikipedia Arabic um, space. So that's another incentive that has emerged. Um, these are the new Arab Wikipedia articles. Some of the students that are familiar with the language actually created some articles in the Arab language. Um, so new incentive is translation. So Adil, are you there? Oh wait. Yes, I am, I'm here. Okay. There I had you. muted my audio because of oh. baby issues. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, Otto's going to talk uh, about the, the Cairo University program. Okay, wonderful. Um, is it possible to share the screen that way I can kind of see where we are? Oh, it's not shared right now? No, it's not. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Apologies for not being there. Um, I am not, um, I can't read your facial cues. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, I want to I want to thank Kelsey for starting us off uh, and helping contextualize uh, the the courses and what we've come what we've come to and what we've done thus far. Um, of course, because the courses that I teach tend to revolve around um, uh, either dissidents or media, but with largely a focus on the on the Arab world, and because of the in incredible pertinence of all of this, everything becomes a current event. Uh, uh, it just so happened that over the last few months, uh, the uh, Wikipedia education program has made significant leaps to, uh, you know, to the Arab world. And of course, the impetus behind that is the fact that uh, Wikipedia Arabic is probably one of the smallest, given the number of speakers of the Arabic language, uh, within the Wikipedia language family. Um, and so the intention is to increase the capacity of Wikipedia Arabic and the amount of content on it and, and really enrich it. Um, and so the work that we've been doing at Georgetown, or at least in, in the courses 
in my courses with the help of Kelsey and the other uh, campus ambassadors, um, we're trying to find a way to uh, to both bridge the sort of the cultural and geographic divide and also support this new sort of fledgling prog program uh, in Cairo. So at Cairo University and another university also based in Cairo called Ain Shems, um, there are um, new Wikipedia courses, if you will, or Wikipedia is being incorporated in, in multiple courses. And because the pilot is essentially this past semester, uh, the yield is being assessed uh, now. Uh, but at any rate, there are significant areas for potential, uh, potential work. The Cairo pilot uh, incorporated or had at least as part of it um, uh, some mass communication courses. And one mass communication course at Cairo University specifically uh, is an, is really sort of an arena where the work that we do here in, in some of my courses overlaps with what they do. So in the list of courses, uh, sorry, of uh, articles contributed by my students uh, in the past two semesters that you saw previously that Kelsey put up, uh, there are sort of articles about um, prominent uh, television personalities, um, revolutionaries, protesters, various sort of technological platforms that people have used, uh, and um, uh, cl famous clerics, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and to a large extent, by looking at the repertoire of material being generated in Cairo, there is significant overlap. So for instance, two articles, this is just as an example, two articles that were contributed to the Arabic Wikipedia through, these, uh, through this one class are one about um, a, a woman called Mona Shazli. She's a prominent uh, television personality. And Bessem Youssef, who is sort of a comedian or sort of a cartoonist turned comedian. He's uh, um, uh, the John Stewart of Egypt, if you will. And in fact, I saw John Stewart a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so uh, to a large extent, there uh, there's an area for potential collaboration. What this collaboration will look like uh, has yet to be seen. Um, the way that sort of we imagine it unfolding is for us to uh, to have students in these courses read over the material being generated here and contribute through possibly translation. So let's let's look at translation a little bit more closely um, because you know the Arabic uh, language Wikipedia is fairly small uh, and uh, of course it's also a, a very well-guarded community because the Arabic language is a very nuanced, very complex language and so the Wikipedians uh, in the Arabic Wikipedia uh, tend to be, uh, for lack of a better word, a little bit more um, sort of diligent. That's a euphemism for how they behave sometimes, but gatekeepers more so than um, sort of format and, subs and substance gatekeepers. Uh, and so it makes it very difficult to contribute to uh, Wikipedia Arabic unless you have a, a very clear and in-depth understanding of the language. So it makes translation uh, a process that is beholden to that. So we need people who sort of are adept and knowledgeable of the language. I've tried it on my end, Georgetown, to have students who do have sort of a command of the Arabic language to contribute in Arabic. And Kelsey showed a couple of you know, at least an example of those two articles. But my students have also contributed to pre-existing articles. So as you can see here, Occupy Bahrain, speak to the, um, uh, uh, the protest in Bahrain. Um, sorry, I think we're, ah, there we go. And Al Masri al which is a major independent newspaper in Egypt. So some of my students went in and contributed to the Arabic uh, articles of those two. If we can go back to the translation slide. Um, now, the problem is, is, is one of sort of overcoming geography. But we do, there are some advantages. Oh, sorry, no, the translation, the previous one. But the, we do have, there are some advantages. It is a two-way process um, for all intents and purposes that material goes from the English language site to the Arabic and the Arabic site to the English. But uh, the trap more so directional from English to Arab, and it has <laughs> it's kind of schizophrenic. I'm <laughs> sorry. Let's see, Otto, we're we're not hearing you. Just hold on a second. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. 
So yeah, I guess you can either see me or the slide. So <laughs> the slide is photogenic. Thanks to Kelsey. Um, so basically, it, it tends to be a one-way process. Uh, where are we? All right, perfect. Thank you. Um, so it tends to be a one-way process, even. <laughs> Issues of translation right now <laughs> happening. Let's see. I think we can the video. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's um, probably a good idea. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the the flow of information from English to Arabic or any of the other Wikipedia languages is far more voluminous than the other way around, um, and it's of course because English is you know to a large extent a lingua franca. And because uh, Wikipedia English has become basically the gold standard of how things operate, um, so everybody takes you know advice from and guidance from uh, Wikipedia English. But um, but nevertheless, there are instances when uh, things go in the other direction. So the the project that we're trying to sort of forge forward with between both Georgetown and and Cairo University or and Shams University um, is to make it a two-way process. And it is sort of a natural two-way process. Uh, for the most part, uh, Wikipedians you know, ag exist everywhere in the world. And most Wikipedians who are writing in Arabic uh, are fairly familiar with, with the English language. Um, and, uh, and they understand the ins and outs of how to operate this. Um, so it has to be initiated by users and editors. The translation projects currently underway between two languages are meant to increase the content in the latter. So that's one of the incentives. But in addition to that, there is another incentive that we tend to overlook, which is the tremendous curiosity of the international community at large. I mean, Wikipedia users are, you know, for the most part, curious about what other people might think might be completely pr frivolous. Uh, and, uh, and so there is the tendency to engage with material that is uh, on the fringes or on the margins of knowledge. And so it makes whatever it is that's being generated from the Arab world particularly interesting and subject to further sort of use. So with that being said, translation, the impetus for translation is to increase the Arabic content on Wikipedia, but also to improve content about the Arab world in, in the English Wikipedia. Uh, and so for the most part, all of the articles that my students have contributed uh, to, the, you know, to Wikipedia that relate to the Arab world, um, I think should have equivalents in Arabic. And in some instances, they don't. So it is a bit, I mean, like, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, it is a tad shameful that the material that um, exists about the Arab world exists in English more so than in Arabic. Uh, so there is you know, sort of a need for the Wikipedia Arabic community to kind of step it up and, and really uh, adopt this. And so we're trying as best as we can from within the educational uh, setting to create those uh, to create those bridges. Uh, can we go back to the previous slide for a quick moment? Um, okay, yeah. For okay, so how do we how do we go about? No, not the trans. Sorry, the next one. The trend. There we. Go. Okay. So the you know what are the advantages that we have on our hands? Uh, first of all, there you know the platform is extremely in interchangeable. Uh, if you understand and know how to operate Wikipedia, irrespective of where you are, there's tremendous translatability in that sense. Uh, the degree of confluence and congruence between the courses um, is an absolute sort of, uh, you know, um, sense part success. In this case, we have what looks like a perfect scenario. Uh, courses in mass communication here and mass communication there that address the same issues and look at the same subject matter. Uh, and so in essence, there is no significant uh, sort of content uh, barrier that has to be overcome. It's, it's, you know, it's not like you're, you have nuclear physics on one and, uh, and uh, sort of theology on the other. This is similar subject. Uh, so, okay, in addition to that, there's a tremendous amount of excitement and thrill doing multi-site uh, uh, sort of experience. Uh, in addition to that, there's something extremely natural about uh, Wikipedia's transnationalness, if you will, uh, that people are naturally collaborative, you know, the Wikipedia community is naturally collaborative and very open and very 
by logic uh, that uh, you know people who edit Wikipedia you know exist in one locale and maybe editing something that is entirely non pertinent to where live or exist or operate geographically so uh, the platform itself not only facilitates it but the community at large adopts transnationalness and that I think is very important and so when we reach out to students both at Cairo University and here at Georgetown um, especially with my students I mean I'll tell you for those who are not particularly familiar with the Arab world um, uh, and uh, you know this was sort of a foray into a new arena for them uh, they became extremely interested and curious and so before you know it you planted the seed and then they continue sort of this exploratory learning beyond the natural boundaries of the Wikipedia assignment. So I think Wikipedia is not only uh, be, you know, taking advantage of transnational scholarship, but itself is contributing to transnational scholarship by international, uh, the kind of work that we do. Um, of course, there is another platform that's extremely vital, which is coordination between the faculty, so Cairo University, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do this. Natural uh, grassroots, level, but in some cases uh, there has to be some degree of formalization. Uh, for instance, there need to be Wikipedia ambassadors either on site or online to assist in the way Kelsey has, for instance, which of course is developing. The architecture is developing now with the with the Cairo pilot project. Um, I, during the question and answer period, I don't know who's in attendance, but if there is anyone from the Cairo pilot, it would be interesting to hear what they've had to say. I know there are a few members of the Cairo program and people who've worked uh, who are at the conference, Wikimania, so they might be able to give us some advice. But at any rate, uh, so long as there's you know, topical material, Wikipedia ambassadors on hand, the universities are in congruent, coordinated. Uh, everything basically falls into place in a fairly natural way. Although we may this far, but uh, I think the the reasoning for all of this is that not only is there an incentive, uh, but so a tremendous need on both sides. Um, so it increases people's familiarity with what's happening, you know, internationally on both sides, of course, uh, but also increases the capacity of Wikipedia in multiple languages to provide information that is adept and sophisticated and interesting and compelling and informative. Um, so for instance, the example that, that the Rust, uh, the RNN network, the, the Facebook news feed, uh, there was a time when my students were literally picking up the phone and trying to call this news feed to figure out who's on the other line, this thing, you know, because there was literally nothing published about it. And now it is basically the news site that reported the elections results initially uh, and has outfits in Syria, Libya. I mean, where protest movement, there's a Rust network. Um, and now, I mean, I could say with some confidence that the Wikipedia article is the only authoritative uh, document about this network that exists online. Uh, everything else is purely speculative. Nothing been verified to the same extent or has been subjected to as much scrutiny as this particular Wikipedia article. So um, while, while the Wikipedia community may have rejected it initially on the grounds that, well, there's not enough reputable information about it, it's now, because of the standards that, and because of the effort of students who knew nothing about it previously, uh, they were able to generate a fairly interesting small article, you know, small short article, but nevertheless, it is the top when you Google Rust because it's, you know, not only is Wikipedia ranked very highly, but also because it uh, it gets a lot of traffic and it's the only explanatory um, page. So a lot of interesting things are, are going on in this uh, in this arena. Um, if the objective is to up the content in Wikipedia Arabic, uh, then collaboration is only a natural process. Uh, and of course, because we're looking at transnational scholarship, as a key component towards enriching education, um, this is, you know, I think a, a, a viable way uh, to go about doing it uh, in the future. Um, so I think Wikipedia presents a very important platform that we can use. So 
Um, Adel, I think we should open it up for uh, questions now. Um, that sounds great. Okay. All right. So um, also, if you're interested in the education program, um, you can go to this link. Um, also, that's the email that you can contact if you're interested in incorporating that into your courses. But I also wanted to say one last thing before we open up to questions was not only is it doing research on Wikipedia, but it also is the groundwork in a sense for the research projects that they end up doing in their graduate courses. So, I mean, just doing the research of, you know, why is a conflict happening over this particular article could be an amazing thesis project. So kind of the idea that bridging kind of the Wikipedia education program with the, the larger curricula of the thesis coursework that is available, not only at the program that I'm in, which is the Communication, Culture, and Technology MA program, but in the Arab Studies program as well. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Um, but so are there any questions about um, the process that we went through or anything? Can I say something really quick? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, just one quick remark. I know that we gave you all of this information, but I think just as a wrap, it's important uh, to keep in mind that this is a replicable um, idea. Um, so for instance, if you're, you know, if you're teaching a course, or if you're taking a course, um, on, let's say, you know, Latin politics or uh, Portuguese language, for instance, uh, you you might might be interesting to look at uh, a similar Wikipedia project that exists in Brazil. If you're looking at, which of course exists, there is an, an education program at Brazilian universities now. The same applies with India. If you're looking at Indian politics, for instance, or uh, contemporary Indian literature, uh, it might to see if that can be coupled. So the transnational scholarship component it goes way beyond you know, what the Arabic program is all about. Uh, and uh, you know, it's just a, the ability to identify areas for uh, potential outreach and collaborative learning. Thanks, Otto. Looks like, Otto, it looks like there's no questions. Means we're or we've bored them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna switch. Otto, um, thank you for beaming in. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. So actually, this is a really great uh, intersection of um, this topic and what we had at Wikimania 2008. How many people here at 2008 Wikimania in Alexandria? Great. I mean, I thought I chose a few of these pictures because these were just great illustrations of what the professor was talking about. This is at the Alexandria Library. This is the day after Wikimania. And a number of us got a kind of a backstage tour of the digitizing operation at the Alexandria Library. And it's amazing because they're doing a lot to put Arabic texts online. As he said, embarrassingly, there's more information in English language on the internet about um, Arabic culture and the content there. So this is just a great uh, uh, you know, moment in Wikipedia's history in, in the sense that we got this tour, but this was also the start of the whole glam movement. It was this visit that uh, Liam Wyatt was on that he started the whole effort to engage folks like the British Museum, Smithsonian, National Archives. So it's a really fascinating uh, operation that they have there. This is their workflow of digitizing Arabic texts, putting them online, and it's a great segue into what we're going to be talking about in this session is that um, we have to keep reminding ourselves that the kind of first world standards that we've imposed and properly adopted in English language Wikipedia cannot simply be dropped into any other Wikipedia, right, or any other Wikimedia project. That the standards of verifiability, um, reliable sources, um, are a luxury that we have in English language, and perhaps German, Spanish, French, because there have been so many efforts to put these texts online but to tell a nascent and budding Wikipedia that you should implement all these very strict policies about V, RS, and all these things is really a hindrance to what they need to do, right? So they might have to start off with a very different set of standards in the early days of starting their, their encyclopedia simply because you need to understand the landscape and how much information is available online to be referenced material. And it's pretty amazing what they're doing at the Alexandria Library to <coughs> have this gigantic scanning operation there um, just to take these texts and put them online. So they have small format scanners, large format scanners, 
You saw all these librarians there with stacks of books starting to digitize all these things. And this is all available online if you go to my Flickr account, just look at Wikimania 2008. This is a slideshow of the backstage pass we had at the Alexandria Library. And pretty fascinating, this is the start of GLAM right here in 2008. And Alexandria had a, had a, had a role to play in that. So I encourage you to take a look at those. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is Wikipedia in a Twitter age. Let me see if I can play this. And I was asked to just to set the table here because I thought it was kind of interesting to, to, to think about how far we've come and where we're going with, um, with Wikipedia's collaboration, both to large organizations, but also to individuals that are out there. So the way I like to see it is kind of like this. Right? We, as Wikipedians, we're right here in the middle. We're in interfacing with different types of information and knowledge. What we're basically seeing with GLAM is actually moving up the food chain, right? Where as Wikipedians, we're collaborating with organizations, museums, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. But we're also going down as well. And this is the big question we have going forward, right? The professor talked about uh, authoring articles and using Facebook updates or Twitter feeds as information that can be used as reference materials. And there's a big question going forward because what is what is uh, hanging over this whole thing? What, why do Wikipedians resist these types of sources? It's basically no original research, right? That's what prevents folks from dipping down there. And there's a very good reason why no original research is a policy in Wikipedia, right? It was mainly to keep out crackpot theories and things that are not verifiable, right? But we actually do have some information that we use right now on it, contributed by individuals that are probably original research that we accept. And I think the two most prominent examples, one is Wiki News, right? If you look at Wiki News, what people report is what they see in their neighborhood and what they're writing articles about. So Wiki News has a role of providing that original research. It's an accepted part of the landscape in the Wikimedia movement. The other thing I think that is, is very useful and encouraged are feature photos. And I mean feature in that um, they're different than cell phone photos of breaking news. But if you haven't had a chance to meet David Shankbone, how many people have met David Shankbone before? How many people know of David Shankbone? He was recently written up as one of the, I guess, most widely published photographers in the world, like the most published photographer in the world. And he's here at Wikimania. I don't know if it's his first one. I think it's his first one. But he is very prolific as a professional photographer. He goes out there and takes a lot of photos of celebrities, politicians, conducts original interviews, and uploads them to Commons. And if you see you know, a David Shankbone picture in Wikipedia, it's likely of a, um, a politician or a celebrity. So he's contributing a lot of feature photos, and a lot of people are right now. But these other ones are the question that we have today. Right? What do we do with Twitter feeds, Facebook updates, mobile photos, GPS trails? And Katie's going to talk about uh, GPS and OpenStreetMap, um, and among other things. Uh, Heather's going to talk about what do we do with content that are that we sense in the field with projects like Ushahidi. Uh, so I'll just leave you this one question, is that we certainly think that there's a role for these things. If you're, as you're looking at the Egyptian Revolution, you see all these tweets and Facebook updates, you know that this is useful, original reporting in the field. But how do you use this as reference material inside Wikipedia? What's the proper role for that? So possibly we could have Wikipedians at the bottom of this pyramid curating and sifting and verifying this information. But are, is the Wikimedia community up to the task? And I'll leave this, this slide for you to take a look at because it's, it's pretty startling. This is a map of, or actually just a chart, of how many Wikipedia administrators in the English language Wikipedia have been promoted every month since the beginning of Wikipedia. And I was first shown this graph by Weir Spielcheckers. He's an English language Wikipedian. And he showed this to me just randomly on the floor of the uh, Wikimedia 2010 floor. Yes? Uh, Andrew, uh, the slide isn't showing. It's uh, I'm, gonna, I'm <laughs> doing the reveal. The dramatic reveal. <laughs> so the dramatic reveal is he showed me this. So he said, this is what we saw in terms of admin promotions going from 2003 to 2010, which is when we were in Poland. You can see that we peaked in 2005. You know, the end of 2005, 67 admins in English language Wikipedia per month were being promoted, more than one a day. 
We had a little bit of a surge in 2007, but if you saw Jack Herrick's talk, if you see me talk over the last few years, we know that 2007 was the heyday of Wikipedia. Ever since then, it's been a slow decline. So in terms of users editing Wikipedia, it's slowly declining, but it's kind of leveling out. But if you look at the admin numbers, it's a little bit troubling because the admin numbers are dropping dramatically. And we've had multiple sessions at Wikimanias in the past about the RFA gauntlet and how acerbic the process is to be an admin. Now, his latest graph of this, this past week, is that. We're promoting about one admin a month. There's been a drop of 30-fold to 50-fold in terms of how many admins we're promoting every month in Wikipedia. Okay. So even if the community is hopefully holding steady, the number of admins, the trusted users in Wikipedia, the ones that we see as the custodians of you know, the, the most uh, cherished information in Wikipedia, we're not promoting them in any great numbers at all. In fact, we're probably net losing folks as people drop off. So I just leave that as you know, the context in which we talk about how do we take this information that could be of great use to Wikipedia but needs to be curated, needs to be managed, do we have those capabilities within the community right now? This is a pretty bleak picture in terms of whether we're up to that task. And it's a challenge to the community in terms of what to do about this situation in the community. That's the gloom, but there's some hope in that there's interesting projects right now looking at how the crowd can be part of the knowledge base of Wikipedia going forward. So um, I want to introduce two folks here that will be talking about this. Um, I'm going to skip that till my talk tomorrow. Um, Katie Philbert and Heather Ford. Katie is a well-known web developer and programmer here in DC. She's part of the organizing team here. She's very active in the OpenStreetMaps project. Um, is a longtime Wikipedian and uh, has worked for Crisis Commons, uh, the Institute for Justice, and a number of other folks here in DC. Heather Ford, um, who's going to be presenting first, is a very longtime friend of Wikipedia. She was on the advisory board of the Wikimedia Foundation for many years. She was the founder of iCommons in South Africa. She was named one of the top 10 women in IT in South Africa, or in Africa, all of Africa, in 2011. <laughs> Um, she's, sh she's shaking her head. She doesn't think she deserves it. Uh, verify. Verify, yeah, <laughs> verify. Uh, she was at the Berkeley School of Information and got a master's degree there, and now she's studying for a PhD at Oxford University, and she's also an ethnographer for Ushahidi. So without further ado, Heather. making them excited that I might say something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually going to talk about a project that um, I've been involved with for the last year. And um, as Andrew said, I, I have a long history with um, open source and open content. But in the last few years, I have decided for various reasons that I want to be a researcher and a writer. And so um, I changed um, a lot of my perspectives because what I really want to see is I want to get evidence um, of this change that's happening in the world and um, I want to be able to, to show real um, real world examples of, of this change so the project that I've been involved with is called understanding sources um, you can find out more about it on the um, <coughs> on the Wikimedia Research website, and there will be a very large report coming out pretty soon, because it has been a year, and so I should be showing something for it. So um, it's been a really, really exciting project, and um, that's actually been the impetus for me to go and do my PhD and study further. Wait for it. <laughs> Wait for it. <coughs> Should be there. Let me just detect the space quickly and see. There we are. There we are. Okay, cool. Yay. Okie dokie, folks. Okay. So, um, the problem that the originators of this project um, were thinking about when they said, let's do this project for a year, was that. We had um, this process on, on Wikipedia that these breaking news events 
were gaining a lot of traction and um, people wanted to write about this really exciting stuff that was happening despite the fact that Wikipedia um, has um, a guideline that Wikipedia is not a newspaper um, and Wikipedia shouldn't try and be um, the news. Um, but Wikipedia was actually involved in these breaking news stories. So you can imagine if you're involved in breaking news stories, um, especially in places where the Western media often isn't around, um, what are Wikipedians doing with sources and what are they doing with what they call reliable sources? Um, I was really curious about this and I wanted to find out exactly um, how people were doing this. Um, and actually, the work that I'm doing is, has a design goal. So I'm an ethnographer. I watch people how um, I watch how people actually use technology. And the end goal of the, the research is actually to help design tools to improve the process for Wikipedians. Now, um, the process right now is kind of complicated. Here we have Katie's um, wonderful list of articles that she came across during the Egyptian Revolution. Um, little articles about specific topics. She made her own wiki page um, as a way to, to house this information because it wasn't really a collaborative way for you to just put something um, on a page and keep it there until you needed to write something about it or until you had time to write the sentence or the paragraph about the army's involvement or about the arrests that were happening. So we thought, okay, well, there must be a better way of doing this. Um, so these were the research questions that we started out with. Um, so instead of just saying we should be talking about social media sources in this way, well done for the person who laughed, I was checking to see whether you were awake. <laughs> um, I wanted to get a, we wanted to get a really grounded understanding of how, peop how Wikipedians are currently doing this, because there's a lot of stories about how Wikipedians um, think about social media sources, but we wanted to get a grounded perspective. The second thing is what verification challenges were people facing? Surely there were lots of challenges um, when it's a breaking news event and a source says something has happened. How do Wikipedians actually know or feel confident that they can write about that? Um, and then thirdly, how can we help editors manage and, and verify sources um, better? Now, originally when we started this project, we were like, oh, this is perfect. All we do is we find some way of ranking the sources. You know, we have, um, we want to have the most reliable sources at the top of the list, and all we'll do is work out what are the variables that um, Wikipedians are using to decide whether a source is reliable or not. And then we have a lovely ranking system like the internet is so good at, you know? Um, and people could vote up or down according to any of those variables. Now, it is said that ethnographers are very painful to um, technologists because what they do is they tell technologists what they shouldn't do, not really what they should do. And it turns out that that's pretty much true. Because when, let's just start off with defining some of the concepts. Now, sources actually play two really distinctive roles in Wikipedia. Often we think about it and we think, oh, it's about verifying facts, whether something happened or not check whether something happened or not, um, and then directly represent that thing or that source in, in the article. So it is 100 degrees today, we go to the weather channel and we check whether it's 100 degree, degrees and we add our citation. But the thing that I found in this research that was really interesting is that the second role of sources is that they verify the importance of a subject. So you can have an article that has lots of citations um, but if the source doesn't reveal that it's important enough to be in Wikipedia, then it shouldn't be in Wikipedia, according to editors. Um, and then the other important thing is it's not just about verifying the importance of an article, it's about verifying the importance of a thing or, an, or a sentence or a phrase within an article. And this became really, really relevant in the Egyptian Revolution article. It became really, really big and so people had to decide um, which elements of this article or which elements of the story should be included and which should not be included. You're summarizing. And in order to summarize, you need to decide which are the most important parts of the story, which are the most important events that need to be reflected in the story. And in a breaking news event, you can imagine, um, everything is, about, is, is really about what is happening 
um, up to the minute. It's not a reflective, um, these were the important factors that led to a revolu the revolution. These were the most critical events on every single day of um, October of 2011, or January of 2011. So um, that was really important. And then the second really critical concept to understand is, is about verification. What do we even mean when we say um, to verify something? Um, now, the important thing to realize about verification is that it is completely contextual and it is um, totally socially determined. So it's not really a technical question. Um, the gentleman over here, um, Todd, I think it was, he said in the beginning of the session, he said, I just need to verify whether Skype works or not. And, you know, Todd's um, understanding of what verifying whether Skype works might be different from someone else's um, understanding of, of what that verification process is. And in the established traditional media, we have established ways of understanding what verification means. When someone, when CNN says, we have as yet unverified information that a bomb has just gone off, um, we, we understand that that's because um, they only have a single source, for example. And in the traditional media, um, verification often means an anonymous source, which would never work on Wikipedia. So verification is very contextual. Now, um, just in terms of policy, because we look at policy first before we look at practice, um, the three important things to realize about sources on the books or in the policy of Wikipedia is um, you must only use reliable sources. You must use predominantly <coughs> secondary sources. Um, so secondary sources are things that summarize, for example, interpret an event, rather than primary sources, which are a person's diary during the Second World War, for example or a uh, personal account of what, has, what is happening um, very close to the event. And the third is to ensure the verification or verifiability, which is really probably, I think, the most critical thing, because you want to enable the users to be able to check back and see whether what, what you have said in this article actually computes with what they believe has happened. And the only way to do that is to provide the source and enable them to go back in there. The first really amazing thing that I realized after everyone said to me, social media sources on Wikipedia aren't allowed, so you can have a really big problem, is that social media sources are, in fact, totally allowed on, on Wikipedia. But, um, so the great thing about the policy, I was really happy about this, it actually doesn't specify media types, which is really great. It doesn't say Twitter is not allowed or social media sources aren't allowed. Um, it says that um, Twitter sources can be used, or social media, or self-published sources, they often call it, are allowed um, as long as they're used about sources. So if Obama, for example, has a verified Twitter account and he tweets um, <coughs> that he hates Obamacare, for example, um, that could be used or interrogated, I guess, before it's used. Um, on, on Wikipedia as his unofficial view, and it would say something like, it is believed that Obama actually doesn't believe in um, healthcare. Um, and then the third is that self-published expert sources, um, and the expert is actually used here, may be considered reliable sources. Um, and so expertise becomes a really interesting concept. What does it mean to be an expert um, uh, when, um, um, in Islamabad when, um, what is the dude who got killed? Is, uh, Osama bin Laden was killed. Um, <laughs> sorry. The, uh, the first Twitter, the first source of that actually happening and um, was, was a, uh, an ordinary guy who became really famous really quickly because he tweeted um, that he heard that a helicopter had just crashed in his neighborhood in Islamabad. Um, so what happens when that becomes a really important part of the question, is that what expertise actually is? Um, and then primary sources are also allowed. Um, in fact, as I said before, they're the only sources that are available close to an event, and we saw this with the Egyptian Revolution, but the policy states that the majority of sources should be secondary. Now, let me get to the real good stuff. So um, I looked at the 2011 Egyptian Revolution article. What I did was I did a thing called grounded theory, um, which is basically to take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of talk pages during um, the time period when um, the first article started 
to when Mubarak resigned. So it was a period of about 10 or 8, uh, to about two weeks. Um, I took all those talk pages and um, selected edits and um, I, I looked through them and tried to see, compare different um, things that were happening and I really wanted to get a detailed account of what happened. And I'm going to focus on very specific, some very short little um, aspects. The report is really in depth and, and you can have a look at it if you want more information. So how did editors on Wikipedia um, in this page um, verify? Now I think, first of all, I just think they did an amazing job. It was incredible. I think all Wikipedia articles should have a deadline or should have the excitement of, a, of an event because people generally got on really, really well. Katie will attest to that um, and did a really good job. So and these are a couple of things that they did to verify. They avoided single sources unless they were really, really sure that it was um, a an absolutely trusted, reliable source. And obviously there's no line here, there's no black and white, there is a gray. Um, but if a single source said something that they weren't too sure about, they said let's wait for another um, source. Now the second thing is a refrain that was said over and over again hundreds of times, which is really interesting, and it says wait, let's wait and see. If there's um, a single source that says something pretty important, like on one occasion, um, some of the sources were saying that Mubarak's family has fled. Um, they said, let's wait and see. We don't have to be breaking news. Um, let's wait and see if other sources um, say the same thing. The third is um, actually reading the source or watching the video to see if it has been accurately reflected. Again, this is what, what happens when you summarize. Often you, don't, you pick out things that don't actually accurately represent the source. And I'll give you an example just now. And the fourth that was really interesting and very contentious among the editors was counting. So people actually, um, naming was a big problem. People didn't know what to call the, well, people knew exactly what to call the article. They just had huge disagreements about it, whether it should be called a protest or evolution or um, all sorts of different names. And so what they did is they started, they, they said, some people said, oh, let's go to Google and see how many hits there are for um, 2011 Egyptian, well, Egyptian revolution or Egyptian protest, and that will be the way for us to decide whether to change it or not. Um, and there was huge disagreement about that, as you can imagine. The first example I want to show you um, of how they actually did this in practice, there was an article, uh, there was a video, and in fact, all the interesting examples came in multimedia and photographs, and this is where all the really exciting stuff is going to be happening, I believe. It's not actually really going to be on Twitter. It's going to be in the um, multimedia example. So here, um, an editor took a screenshot of an Al Jazeera video. He put it up on Commons. This is actually Norwegian because I couldn't find one in um, English, which means it might have been deleted. But um, this, uh, and they called it "Police in Civilian Cloth Beating a Protester in Cairo." Now. Um, Someone actually found the video, one of the editors um, found the video. Um, it wasn't actually linked on the Commons page, which is a problem and, and one of the things we probably need to look at in terms of tool building. Um, he took the screenshot, he made the, th uh, so th the editor came and, and brought this and said, I've watched the video, there's nothing in the Al Jazeera video or commentary that actually says that these are policemen um, and that that's a protester. So it doesn't identify them. Um, and they had a huge debate about it because the guy, it's a Polish IP actually, he was an IP, he wasn't a registered user, um, he said, um, well you can't just change the caption because the file name um, identifies these people. And they had a huge disagreement about that. But in, in the end, as you can imagine, they, um, they changed the caption and then they actually removed they removed it, so it's not on the page at the moment. Another really interesting example, now this is the only example that I've seen at least in the, um, the, the, the pages that I've been looking at, uh, the talk pages that I've been looking at that actually refers to Twitter, um, but it actually reinforces one of my key findings of this research that the source is not the same as the site. So because of the way that Wikipedians often argue about these things, they don't want to put that a social media source or whatever, um, or a small newspaper in their home country is the, s is the source of the article or the source of the stuff that they're writing about. That is the source, but they write, they give another example of, 
of a, uh, a more reliable, at, at least in terms of what other people think is, or what the majority think is reliable. Um, so in this case, um, there was some disagree. Th this was right in the beginning, and they didn't know whether what the army's involvement in the protests were, whether they were involved, whether they were against. And um, someone actually came and said that army involvement are actually refuted on Twitter. Um, and that's why there was this confusion. So it was actually the primary source. People, um, perhaps part of the army, were, were um, refuting that they were involved um, on Twitter. Um, and then the second really interesting thing here, um, in those early days, the 27th of January, so there was, I can't even remember, I haven't looked at this for so long, but I think that was just a day or two after, um, where it actually says the best source is on YouTube, and it's in Arabic. And that's why I was really interested in this, um, this article, because it, you know, at least in the beginning, it is Egypt, so they are, there is actually quite strong media presence there, but um, there obviously a lot of the, the on the ground um, stuff was, was coming in Arabic. The other example of how people verified was, so this is a really um, interesting case, and I'd love to hear from anyone else if they've seen the same thing in other articles, but it feels like, um, because Al Jazeera, this is, was the coming to, um, to power almost of Al Jazeera and um, people were watching TV all the time so they were updating and they're watching TV but there's no way really for you to reference a source a TV source um, on Wikipedia even though by policy it should be you should be able to do it but people just don't generally do it and someone had said an opposition leader said the talks would not be held with Mubarak but only with the army and actually they said sourced to TV or TV, <laughs> I can't remember what exactly what it was, um, which obviously wouldn't, wasn't detailed enough perhaps. And um, this is what, what happened a lot in the talk pages. People worked really well collaboratively. Okasi, one of the top editors, came and brought this and he said, does anyone have any ideas? Um, and the Egyptian liberal gave something that wasn't very um, worthwhile actually because he just said it was al Barade, but that wasn't what they were asking for. They are asking for a, a source. Um, then Lihas tried a bit, but he also didn't know whether it was Al Jazeera. And then Silver Serency came and said, "Ha! Huh, here is the um, the actual. The, here is an here is a source. It isn't the source, but it's a source." Um, and they congratulated each other very nicely. And the last <laughs> example. <laughs> no, it's important. It's very important. Um, then the last article again were about army, the army siding with protesters. Um, oh, th so this is actually just an example of how um, one source is added to by another um, another editor. So all of this is being done in the talk page. Um, people were actually really creative. I was surprised at how creative they were about how they could really um, do this with such. Um, backward in a way technology um, but but there in, in ways it's actually not backward at all because it enables you to to do all sorts of things that the technology necessarily or technologists wouldn't have imagined now in the end of this I realized that um, you know I said ethnographers tell you what you shouldn't build um, so you can imagine that ranking systems I believe aren't should not be built for this and the key reason is because of this very simple fact and that's that the reason why someone uses a source in a Wikipedia article has some things to do with these variables that determine whether something is reliable or not, New York Times is, something else isn't, but there's all sorts of independent variables that have absolutely nothing to do with the source and those independent variables include things like are um, in the article, within the context of the article, are the majority of the sources secondary sources? You can't, you can't um, tell just by clicking on a, um, on a source whether what the article is saying. So that's one of the independent variables. Um, the other is what is the article about? Because a, a source, even an inaccurate source, actually could have incredible use being cited um, when it's not reliable at all because it's about something, um, uh, a rumor that was spread, for example, by an inaccurate source. 
Um, so an article that's also independent variable. And then the third is how recent is the event that's being discussed. That has a huge, huge role in determining what the bar or the barrier to what is considered a reliable source or not is. And so who knows, I hope you guys help me with this because um, I haven't given this to the developers and they're going to be really upset with me. But if you want to read the whole report, it will be up in a few weeks. I keep saying it's going to be up today or tomorrow, and then it, but it will be up in the next few weeks. Um, and that is the link to the project page. Thank you. I'll just talk about my experience like working on this article and um, some like context is like back in 2008 I was living in Egypt for a while and of course that like coincided with Wikimania so just have fond memories of like after Alexandria people went back to Cairo and I remember like telling like Sue Garner and the Wikipedians like let's meet in Tahrir Square and I'll take you around and like so it's like we have like fond memories and like we know like well like I have friends who were there like back in 2011 and, and it's like so that's the reason I was very interested and um, and so it was like a few days before the revolution uh, like I'm still on or was on like mailing list for like just like there's for like students and like foreigners and people in Cairo there's like a really strong like like network and so people were talking about it days before and then the State department issued like an advisory and like the Tunisian revolution had already happened, so I, I just knew, I, like, I, I knew like something big was going to happen and, uh, ahead of time, and I think everybody knew. Um, and so I was like back here in Washington. I couldn't be in Cairo; like, would have been like amazing. But I was here, so like I couldn't. Like, like so it's like, what can I do? And, and I'm like a Wikipedian, and I, like I've written a few featured articles, so it's like I know how how like just like how it works. And um, so it was like back in like 2009 or 2010, like I took a little bit of like a wiki break uh, and I like got more involved with OpenStreetMap, Project Cloud, um, too many tabs. How do I turn? So I was involved with this Project Cloud, Crisis Commons, which in January 2010, there was like the Haiti earthquake and people like, um, used like the tool Ushahidi um, to uh, collect like tweets and, and information from people on the ground there, like to use SMS and like stuff to like tweet, uh, like I'm stuck, I'm trapped in a building, like come save me. And um, so like there's a network of volunteers up in like Boston and New York and like here in DC and everywhere around the world who um, translated from Creole or whatever, uh, translating the stuff, and like, like we got it to like the co Coast Guard and the military down, and like, so it's like real, a real quick response. Like, so like that's a very different like use of like Twitter, but like so like Crisis Commons and Ushahidi, and uh, there's like standby mapping task force that has like done this sort of thing in various ways, like in for Libya, like because there were refugees like on the borders, so like use the same like kind of approach to get information and then uh, help the um, UN um, organization and Red Cross organizations who were like helping people there. So like I got involved with that and, and so and and through that like I met like this guy Andy Carvin at NPR. Like he, he would have been here, like he's traveling, he really loves Wikipedia and like it's like a few years ago he created a, a like I think it was after Katrina. Or no, it was after like another hurricane, like big hurricane, that like, you created a hurricane wiki to um, collect like just crisis information, and then um, he started a project called Crisis Wiki, which it hasn't really worked great yet, using semantic media wiki to uh, like to just collect just I don't know, just basic information about like like pre being prepared in a, an emergency, like but. He's also like the social media guy at like NPR and he's like amazing Twitter and and so like with the Tunisian revolution he was just like there like just like almost like he didn't sleep like twenty four hours a day, like he, he he knew people, he knew like had a network of like Twitters like that he trusted and uh, kept like retweeting stuff and like just like curating like the Twitter sphere 
in a way that was amazing. So then he did that again for Egypt. He's doing that for Syria now. He's like, it, like just uh, amazing. And so like when the Egyptian revolution started, I was like there with this like Twitter feed open, like my own, because I had like fascinating people. And uh, with like Al Jazeera and like with Arabic, English, um, there were sources like Al Masri Al Yom in Arabic, like sources like that that like I really trusted and it's, like, sources like the New York Times, like they weren't there in a way, like they were in like, New York. So like I trust <laughs> sources sources that are there and, and I am just like the like sometimes on Wikipedia, like you know, there's like a systematic bias and you have a lot of like American and European like people young while I'm like editing English Wikipedia and so like and especially when Wikipedia started and it was like many years ago, like before Twitter, it's like the idea of like what are reliable sources that's like the New York Times, CNN, and, like then is a bias towards uh, towards like American sources and like the idea of, like like obscure like like not reliable. It's like in Arabic, like they're I don't know, like they're they're like Stereotypes about them and like oh, like something in Arabic like I must be on you and like people that can't read that it's like you know, it can't be reliable no it it is like they're there and, and so we used to use sources like that for like the topic like the revolution so um, and so like like now it's like it was 2011 we have tools like instead of like well like New York Times like they eventually did get there and had people tweeting which is cool but. You know, sources like Global Voices, which is a network of bloggers and people like so instead of like New York Times sending people there, it's like like there are people everywhere and like that's I think a network of these people who are like I guess they're vetted like in some way, but um so like it they curate this information. So you have sources like that. Um there's this tool called um no, let me uh, I don't know what's wrong with my screen, but there's like a site called Storyfy, so like Andy can uh, like like collect his tweets and like other like snippets, pictures from like Flickr or, or like wherever and try to like, like you can build a story and like this is a way to like help archive this kind of information and like he's doing it so I trust him and uh, like, like this is helpful. Um, you also have like Al Jazeera, like they're really progressive about like how they do reporting and like like I wanted to have someone from them there here also but couldn't. Um but like they use U Shahidi for the Gaza war back in I think it was two thousand eight two thousand nine, January two thousand nine. They use this to help curate information and and they also do cool stuff like Creative Commons. So it was like back during the Egyptian revolution they um they had like videos like they were creative comments, non commercial, so like I emailed them, I was like, hey, like you want to use this on Wikipedia, would you like consider making it uh, like like just like attribution only or, or something so we can use it and like like the director of uh this, like uh, it was like media, he was like the director of this online stuff, like he emailed me back in like two minutes and said, like, yes, I changed it. Like it was amazing. So we got like some videos like on like with media comments and in, in, in the article and and so, like, they're also, like, back, back at the time, there is an organization called, um, well, like, a project called Ushahid, so it's a variation of Ushahidi, it's a, like, a, they were, like, modern, monitoring elections, like, for, uh, like, like, it was November 2010, they had an election, and, like, all sorts of violations of, like, free elections, so, like, they mapped, okay, people reported, uh, like, they're, like, ballot selfing or whatever like here and then they so collect that information so they have a record of that and they, they've been doing that since but also like created a, a like this Ushahidi map of, for the revolution just to report okay so I think so the, I mean just to show you what it looks like so this is a kind of tool that like like maybe in some way it could be like like useful for to, to collect information as a like a holding bin instead of like this wiki page of uh, this long, and, and it and it, ge it, it geo like locates stuff. So like this is a um, like it was like a daughter of a poet was like kidnapped like here on like this street. So it's like so like you get this information in a geographical way that's useful, and 
like here's like the admins. This isn't really like sophisticated, but you can like specify like hashtags or things for it to capture, and then, then like you're able to okay like but sitting there with my Twitter feed open, but stuff goes by so fast and I can't like capture it all like like quick enough, and I'm watching TV also. So like this is useful, and it, if this was in a way that like there's a project called Swift River, which is like I'm not sure the status of it now, but they're trying to like come up with a smarter way to okay like you trust these people and try to like instead of just everything with a hashtag, try to filter it in a little bit of a smarter way, but you still need someone like Andy Carvin or like us to like curate that and decide, okay, what's appropriate for Wikipedia. And uh, so I mean, like, came up with this, sources like, so like through that came up with sources like these, uh, like some of them were like from YouTube, like things that Andy or, or somebody tweeted, I saved them here because like I couldn't like incorporate them into Wikipedia fast enough or I wasn't sure like what I wanted, but sorted them by topic. And you yeah, have like, um, let's see. So you have like tweets like this one. So so PJ Crowley was like like assistant to Hillary Clinton in the State Department and like if he tweets something like he's reliable, like like there's no reason like you can't use this and, and until it gets in the New York Times in the short term, let's use like this as a source and later when we have time like we can go in and like find more like permanent better sources, but like we wanna update the article in real time so like that's that's what we did and so like because like we all like nobody like argued no no one disagreed out like like I'm like I love the Egyptian I love Mubarak nobody did like everybody agreed and nobody nobody argued so I mean this this works so like these are kind of like borderline sources if it was like Israel Palestine okay maybe would just be arguing and then have to be a, like can't use these sources like have to use um um like New York Times because like I don't know but or BBC but for this it, it worked. And I mean, for something like like totally different topic, like the tsunami in Japan, like I'm not exactly sure how that worked, but I mean, it's the same sort of thing where no one's gonna disagree really. I hope not. <laughs> um, so like like sources, so you can use sources that are like there, like what's the like what's happening, and, and they're like current and and. and Later, like when I'm done with this mania, maybe I'll have time to go back to the Egyptian Revolution article and like, just like make it better. But like, like that's just how we did it when it was like it's a real crunch for time and wanted to get it updated as fast as possible with the best information. And, and also, like tend to work because I was here, so I was like watching Al Jazeera and uh, I got tired and go to sleep. And then I uh, like the Lee House and Egyptian Liberal like were working, and then I woke up and it's like. Everything was like so good, and it was like, and then they, they went to sleep, and then that was like working on an article. So, so let's like take some questions. Thank you. I'll <laughs> so, let Andrew do the and talk. Yeah. Was the article protected during the revolution? Um, it it, it was semi protected. There's like. Um, two s ways of protecting. One is full protection, uh, which is extremely rare. Like, or only admins can edit. Or semi-protected, where if you're like, like IP editors, you're a little logged out, like they can't edit. And um, so it's just to uh, like, I don't know, I mean, like vandalism, but I don't, I don't know that. It was, I don't know like how much it was like protected there. Like, let me find out.
And what is it that Wikipedia is trying to present with respect to this unfolding news that hasn't been verified by sort of years of third party sources? Is it, is it more important to give people um, really good information in terms of verifiability for the best information that's known at that time? Mm -hmm. Is it better to put up something that might be wrong than not put anything up at all? Do you have to say I don't know? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, I think the interesting thing is that there is so much division within the Wikipedia community about those two things. Um, so, for example, um, whether it's better to put up something that you're not quite sure about or whether, whether you should put it up even if... Um, so if, if you're not quite sure about it or whether you actually know that it's happened, um, there's huge division about that, which I actually think is a good thing because it's like a high attention. Um, so, and that's why you have edit wars because someone will say, um, I mean, everyone has to bring a source. So um, the question becomes how verifiable is that source and how many sources are saying that? Um, and people's bars are basically different. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can give you a couple of examples, but basically I think it isn't that mm. Wikipedia has a particular, right. well, I mean, I guess Wikipedia would say in terms of policy, um, we only put up um, stuff that has reliable sources and that is completely mm. accurate, and we're not a new source, so we should wait. But uh, I would just say, I mean, it's just very nuanced, and like, Andrew, like, in the beginning talked about, like, different Wikipedias who have, like, different standards, I think, like, you can look at like English Wikipedia also, and it's like an article by article basis, uh, and just case by case basis. Each like I don't know, like each bit is like how, what you do like might be different, but it's very nuanced. And so just the idea that Wikipedia has a like one like p p policy, one set of policies that apply across all the how many four million articles, um, one s set of policies. It's like no, it's like very nuanced, and it's like. I don't know, unless you get into an argument and then it'll get brought to the <laughs> admin notice board, like you kind of can like somewhat do these like, like your own thing, like within limits, like ignore all rules, it's like I love it. But I mean, just each case is different and I don't, there's no one. Like, yeah, there's no, no one rule universal about that. way so anyway of handling things. So we have multiple questions. I'd love to just go around and just collect the questions because I don't want to choose one and leave five out. So why don't we just go around the room and just have you ask your questions and hopefully we can round it up at the end. Yeah, I, I like your question about how do we mediate, um, you know, the, the Facebook right now, they're kind of in external links and the policies kind of deliver the fuzzy, which is good, but it needs more supervision or guidance for people so they stop fighting and kind of come around. All right, let's go ahead. You said that nobody disagreed about the bar, but in the future you think that the bar might actually <laughs> right, right. Let's go around and c collect more. Yep. There was talk about you know what's what's a, a reliable source. Um, I think it's less about a source in its entirety. I think it's more about um, individual pieces of information in a source and what is primary and secondary information within the source. So one source could be a, a good source of one piece of information and a hideous source for another piece of information. So I think it's snippets of information. It's not about the whole source. Right, right. Keep going around. I was curious about administrator backlogs, you know, the, the chart you showed. There's a dramatic decline, but I wanted to know, has there also been a dramatic increase in administrator backlogs? Mm. Yeah. <coughs> I think it's really a, a challenge, the style of writing is that and so Wikipedia articles or Wikipedia articles. But often with the normally media, they, they may write according to Wikipedia by President Obama, you know, like on game law, which is, you know, the way to say that late at night he came up with such a... So, and I, I'm thinking that it's, been, it's like there any rules of style of writing that do we need to stay this is the fact and this is the reference to that or could we or is it possible to be more open that according to certain source mm -hmm. this is the case have you seen this or did this take place in the 
mm. in the history of editing that stuff. Right. Oh, yeah. I was thinking a lot about what you were saying about replacing the tweet with quote-unquote more reliable sources. Mm -hmm. And um, like Chomsky's argument that things like the New York Times deliberately avoid re reporting on certain events. Mm -hmm. So if you adopt a policy that says we're going to use like you know the New York Times or the Washington Post or the LA Times as the most reliable news source, then if you say we're going to mm -hmm. place, we're going to deliberately leave out reporting, okay. so that there really is a place for something like Twitter or Facebook because it's going to report on things that or left out. Well, I mean, like, in the end, like, it's just, like, MS Vodium or Al Jazeera, or, like, like, maybe, like, the tweet is still the, mis the best source, but y you have time to, like, uh, like, revisit and, like, think about that. And it's not, like, like, the breaking news. Talk some more. Yep. Um, I completely agree with that comment, and I want to thank you all for bringing attention Good big question for the last one. Uh, go one more. Yeah. Just a quick response to what J Joseph talked about. I think it's a really great question. I think the, the norms that the, you know, there's a certain community of at least English Wikipedia editors that just love following breaking news and updating articles, whether it's the uh, London train bombing, tsunami, Sichuan earthquake, all these things. And I think they've, they've triangulated on a pretty decent norm, which is basically not to, you know, the classic Wikipedia saying is it's not about truth, it's about, you know, referencing and, and verifiability. And they'll just say, there's five different news organizations with different estimates, and we're just going to give you a chart of who's estimating what. So instead of trying to say only one is right, they're saying here's the five estimates. They're wildly across the map, but you figure it out, reader, in terms of what we're giving you. And I think in general they've converged on that, which is not a bad approach. But I do think that Joseph's a, Joseph's a, Joseph's a good point is, is Wikipedia still meant to be kind of a snapshot living, breaking news feed in that sense, and what do you do in that case? I, I'd be interested to see what other languages have come up with as a norm for this, but I think English language probably has the most, uh, the, the, the most traffic in terms of people reading an English language Wikipedia article to get the exact snapshot of what's going on in the world. I don't know, Heather, with you have any other ideas? I have two um, things that I wanted to say. The first is around policy. So I th actually think the policy doesn't need to be changed. I think the policy needs to be added to. There was two areas that I think um, needs additions, and the first is social media, and the second is multimedia. Um, as I said in the talk, there is actually nothing really in the policy that says that you can't have social media sources, but no one knows. I mean, well, not no one, but um, the the number of people and like experienced Wikipedians who said to me in the beginning, "Oh, you can't have social media sources," and then actually looking at the policy and realizing, "Oh, actually, there." there are, um, and looking at the reliable sources notice board when almost every single um, case that gets taken to them is about social media, I think, they need to, I think the policy needs to incorporate exactly, you know, be a lot more specific around social media sources, and the second is around multimedia, because actually the rules change a lot. 
um, when you think about photographs and video. And I think it needs to be a lot more explicit so that people can understand the issues better. So those are just two additions, which is better than changing the policy. I actually don't think no original research. I actually don't think it, it needs to be changed. And then the second thing I wanted to say, Timu, great question. There is a, a wonderful case that I want to write up on Demi Moore. Um, and actually, Andrew was basically saying this, but what, what Wikipedians do a lot is, so Demi Moore has an, a, a verified <coughs> Twitter account. She said in a couple of, one or two tweets, that her name is different from the name that um, a lot of People magazine or whatever give. And it's a wonderful case because there's two unreliable sources. One is Twitter, one is People magazine, and a whole bunch of other magazines like that. And actually, the article is beautiful. It says, um, it, her name is generally Demi, the, the second name is the one I keep forgetting, but her name is generally known as Demi blah blah Moore, um, but um, these two Twitter posts from her verified accounts say that um, her name is not actually that and she should know because she's Demi Moore. So um, I actually think it's not as much of a problem as, as we think often. The end of um, we're over, already over time, so I think we have to break. Um, we're, we're stopping at 1210 or okay? I know, but I figured. Okay. You should, I mean, there were so many questions, you should get like two minutes. Katie, do you want to respond to any of the questions that um, we put out there? I mean, I, I think I'm good. I mean, I could just add about like like the new original research. Like, I also do open street maps. So it's like one time I was like just like standing in front of a historic church in um, Belgium with my GPS and I was like, I'm take like GPS coordinates and put them on Wikipedia versus like going to Google Maps and getting them, which is like, um, and so it's like I got into a little argument with the Slim Virgin, I love her, but like, like about or, like whether that's like, it's original research, you can't do it, or is it like verifiable because somebody else can go with there with the GPS and verify it. In the same way, like you can use like some like archival or source that oh, I mean, it's maybe it's only in the DC Historical Society and nowhere else in the world, and not online. And the only way like like somebody can go there, so it's like it's like just specific cases, like Heather says, like refine the policy, and then it's specific cases like that. It'd be nice to have right. policies clarified. Yeah, I, I think w one thing we were talking about when we we're preparing for this is what I would call either synthesized research or sensor-based research, right? So I would consider GPS trails. Um, photographs, what I call sensor-based, right? Using a device, you're capturing it. There's some, at least technical method of not necessarily verifying it, but a, a process by cap for capturing that information in some way, um, you know, correlating that to other information. Whereas synthesis, like anyone who remembers the time cube controversy in Wikipedia, crackpot <laughs> theories that just people put out there, that was, I mean, time cube and other things are the reason why NOR exists in Wikipedia, right? Um, but I just want to point out that we're going to have a session tomorrow that I'll be part of with, with Achal Pralaba, and he's on the advisory board of the Wikimedia Foundation. And it's the oral citations project that I put on the graph earlier today that is one of the projects that he's pushing that is butting up against this no original research problem. And he believes in you know, going out and doing interviews, oral interviews with folks, and let, letting that be referenceable, referenceable material in Wikipedia. And that has been um, under discussion, whether that violates NOR. So we're going to be talking about that and other types of efforts tomorrow. So I if, encourage you, if you're interested in that issue, to go to our session tomorrow. Right. Thanks a lot, folks. Thank you.